गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन स्पीकर ऑफ द डे डॉक्टर वंदना शिवा मिसेस यामिनी दलाल वाइस प्रेसिडेंट चेतन मेंबर्स ऑफ द दलाल फैमिली गेस्ट प्रोफेशनल कॉलिग्स यंग फ्रेंड्स इन द फ्रंट रोज वेलकम एवरी वन I'm really delighted to welcome all of you to this annual lecture under the auspices of Dilip Dalal Oration Fund created in the memory of our very own past president late Shri DN Dalal. Bombay Chartered Accountant Society was set up in 1949 to promote ongoing professional education for chartered accountants in the field of accountancy taxation and such allied subjects. however that is not all that we do and we wish to carry out it is our vision that we bring about better policies and laws also and help professionals to become good citizens not only of their own country but the universe at large to open up the members to deeper and broader dimensions that life has to offer so that we can learn and contribute to our own society in that context the society organizes seminars workshops residential programs and brings out publications but also runs a foundation that carries out philanthropic work of the society specifically in the field of right to information late dilip dalal was our 38th president who passed away in 1987 at an untimely age of 37 and that too in the midst of his tenure as the president of the society apart from his achievements as a professional which is usually writing books articles talking and so on he was also a very well rounded and a good human being although i have never met him but i have heard that from lot of friends and my family who knew him that he was a good human being and this lecture meeting is the 21st lecture in this string of lecture meetings held in his memory and all that he stood for in the past we have had some of the finest speakers such as shri satyanarayan goenka ji swami tejomaya anand chitra bhanu ji mr narayan bagul mr mohandas bai and so on just to name a few and today we are privileged to have dr vandana shiva a very special person i have to say to speak to all of us on a very important topic friends over last few hundred years humanity has generated massive amount of knowledge and reportedly made unimaginable progress previously not known to our race at the same time if we look at the number of killings in wars in last few hundred years a human killing another human that's also a record of sorts let alone human killing other human beings be on one side as a species supposedly with a high level of intelligence we have also been very violent through our behavior whether it's individually or collectively advertently or deliberately destroying other living organisms at a pace like never known before so obviously there is something wrong with where we are headed the way we are educated and how we look at life that is disastrously fragmented and selfish for example in the commercial capital of mumbai people look at economic indicators all the time if you hear anyone talking you go down or you meet somebody in a restaurant everyone's talking about some index going up some index falling down yet we have forgotten the word eco where its origins are and its etymological roots are in greek oikos which means home and not just our home our flat our few thousand square feet house which we purchase for several lakhs or millions or whatever 
But all that is, this entire universe full of diversity. Today we have disconnected the ecology, the knowledge of our home from economy, which means managing of our home. And therefore we see the effect of what happens when such disconnect take place. And we have people who manage our home with little knowledge of our planet or who have significant disregard for this relationship amongst all living beings. Growing up, I learned a few ancient wisdom of India and oftentimes you find it written in Sanskrit, which is a beautiful language filled with beauty of great meaning. And one common one that a lot of us may have heard before is this phrase, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, which says that the whole universe is one family, is my family. However, if one looks at the full verse, it reads like this. For one with constricted mindset considers some to be related to him and others not related. Whereas the one with an expansive consciousness considers the entire universe as nothing but his own family. And the words they use is Udar Charitanam. And these are beautiful words. Udar means magnanimous, generous. And Charit comes from the word Char, which means something that moves. In this context, and particularly in the area of food, which is fundamental to our existence, we are privileged and truly honored to have with us Dr. Vandana Shiva, a living example of these words, Udar Charitana, one who walks the earth with expansive consciousness and with a generous disposition. She has made incredible contribution in dealing with challenges of mindless corporate-led globalization that is causing serious damage to social, economic, ecological, as well as economic facets of our society. Before I request Radhika Shah to formally introduce the speaker, I request Vice President Chetan to present a memento to Dr. Shiva as a mark of our appreciation and regard. Namaste, Dr. Shiva, uh, dear friends of Bombay Chartered Accountants Society, my family and friends gathered here. Thank you so much for coming this evening. This parampara of hosting a lecture annually in the memory of our late father, Sri Dilipan Dalal, has been going on for over past 30 years. But today and this year, we conclude this tradition of hosting a lecture in his memory. And we're very fortunate to have amongst us Srimati Dr. Vandana Shiva, a prominent voice and an activist in the fields of environmental needs, organic farming, activist for women's rights, and <coughs> farmer's suicide. Over the years, as I have become a parent to my children, Ahan and Anushka, I realized that making smart choices about nutrition and health matters the most in most families. Along this journey, I was very fortunate to come across the work of Dr. Shiva. I'm guilty of not reading all your work, but I have made some time in the last eight, nine years to read your work on organic farming, soil, not oil, water, uh, uh, forgotten foods like amaranth, so mustard oil. And I was very much enlightened by my uh, reading and knowledge that I had gathered. As a result of this, I was able to change our dietary preferences and palate at home. And I also started being more mindful about buying produce or groceries that were fair trade certified, most hopefully cotton that was organically manufactured. For instance, I'm wearing one of these Navdanya manufactured stoles that's pure khadi. And uh, Gandhiji was a big advocate of khadi. And this is made with organic cotton, leaf blocks, using organic dye. So, uh, you know, all of us are big believers of the products and the cause that you are supporting, Dr. Shiva. 
I'm very grateful to you for joining us this evening and making the trip, especially given that you just flew from Iran yesterday and from New Delhi this morning. Um, and I thought that it would be very nice to share a, a personal moment with Dr. Shiva. When I met her in New York in 2010, I was quite fortunate to have some alone time with her. And I asked her that, how do you wish to communicate your vision to the world? And she said, she kind of paused and for a second, and then she said, Radhika, one light bulb at a time. And I thoroughly understand today how you're able to do that. I think you need a person who's unselfish, believes in serving others, and overall loves humanity. Dr. Shiva, we are here, gathered this evening to be enlightened us. Kindly join me on the stage, please. Thank you very much, Radhika. Um, thank you to the Chartered Accountants. Um, to keep my books here? Okay, thank you. Um, to Yamini Ji, um, who obviously had a beautiful relationship with the Lindalal, to have kept this lecture series going for 30 years. Um, and uh, as soon as I got the invitation, I said, we'll work it out one way or the other. So I'm very honored to be here, which is both a celebration of your family, Radhika, um, but also of the chartered accountants. If they could have Dalit Dalal and now you, as presidents, you're obviously a special community that is not just accountants in the narrow sense of adding numbers. A lot of people ask me, how did you move from physics and quantum theory? And the reason I worked on the foundations of quantum theory was because um, when I was doing my PhD in particle physics, I wanted to ask foundational questions. So what is the quantum world really like? You know. What, what is it telling us about the world? And uh, my guide, who was the most brilliant particle physicist of India at that time, he's no more, he said, just do the calculations, Vandana. I said, no, Dr. Viswas, if I had to do calculations, I'd be an accountant. <laughs> so I went ahead and did a PhD on the foundations of physics and foundations of quantum theory. And that journey has now made me spend, you know, I've spent 40 years uh, in the service of nature and Mother Earth, but 30 years of that have been spent on both understanding agriculture and the two models of agriculture, one based on poisons, the other based on ecological systems, as well as building the alternatives. And I'm so glad my colleagues, Lata Sharma and Rita Balsavar, who uh, take care of the program in Maharashtra and also have an organic shop in Andheri um, are able to join us because I hope you will become partners with them. You're so right about a very, very deep civilizational philosophy we have, which of course says you've got to live at peace with the earth it says you have to take into account all species, not just humans. I think it's a philosophy that from the beginning has not been anthropocentric. It's not just about humans. Humans are part of the web of life, and therefore, Vasudheva Kutumka. And it's that web of life that is my first passion to protect. When I saw it being assaulted by methods of agriculture, uh, that we call green revolution or industrial. Um, and I was woken up to this in 1984 with the Bhopal disaster. Many of you are so young, but that is a disaster that everyone will remember. And that same year, something interesting happened in Punjab. The army was sent to the Golden Temple. It was made to look like it was about Khalistan. Khalistan was a media creation. 
The reality was fa the farmers were going to blockade the supply of grain. As they said, we can't decide what we'll grow, we can't decide how we'll grow it, we can't decide the price. They said, which other producer can't fix the price of what they sell? A car manufacturer fixes it. Even a real estate developer fixes the price. But a farmer is not allowed. And so they basically were saying we're living under slavery. And what was called the Khalistan movement was really a farmer's protest. So when I was reading the newspaper this morning on my flight coming down, I noticed one line about what's happening in Gujarat right now. And the line said, we are going to block supplying vegetables and fruits. That made me realize that if they're talking about vegetables and fruits, they're primarily farmers. They happen to be Patels. Just as much in Punjab, they were primarily farmers, they happened to be Sikhs. And in any situation like this, where the stakes are very high, and the stakes in chemical farming are very high, the profits to be made are huge. And where did these chemicals for agriculture come from? From the war. Companies that had made big money during the war making explosives, which then the factories became the source of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, or the poison gases and uh, uh, nerve gases, which were used in the concentration camps and the war. They're all the original pesticides. And that's the techniques that were then developed to have the thousands, hundreds of thousands of poisons that we spray. This has been so clearly recorded in the two people who've uh, been a big inspiration for me to understand agriculture. One, of course, was Rachel Carson, because of whose work, the silent spring, the US environmental movement took birth and the Environment Protection Agency took birth. The other was in what they call the imperial economic botanist that the British sent to India in 1905 to change India's agriculture. He found the fields were fertile, there were no pests in the farms, and he said, I'm going to make the Indian peasant my professor to learn how to do good farming. I can teach England more from here than England can teach India. The book he wrote as a result of the, under the professorship of Indian peasants, which is the continuity of a farming philosophy of 10,000 years based on the concepts of Vasudeva Kutumkam. That book is called Agricultural Testament. We have copies there. It is now called worldwide the Bible of Organic Farming. The Soil Association of England, the Rodale Institute of the USA are all institutions that were born because of that book. And that bo book was born because he was humble enough to say, I'm going to learn. So I think on 4th of October, we are going to uh, go to, he was sent to Pusa, and eventually he gave up Pusa and came to Indore, and started what he called the Indore process of composting. And I've managed to persuade the Agriculture University that you've come out of Howard's work, at least recognize him in the year of soil. 2015 is the year of soil. And Howard wrote so clearly, the health of the soil determines the health of the plants, and the health of the plants determines our health. Health is one continuum. There's no division. So if you spray poisons and your soil organisms die, your plants are diseased and we become diseased. But when you do organic farming, what you get is healthy soils giving healthy plants and healthy children. We are what we eat in a very real sense. And the epidemic of disease in India has just exploded. Individual families are suffering the consequence. The nation has not woken up. For those who are not privileged, they're not getting enough food. Not because this land cannot produce food. I travel the world. Most countries that are treated as grain giants have three months of cultivation season. Look at Canada, look at large parts of the US, look at large parts of Europe. For three months they can farm. 
We have farmlands that can give four crops. That's why they talk about four crop land, three crop land. When land issues take place, the area in the Western Hearts where the famous nuclear debate is taking place, it's a perennial agriculture, prosperous. And that's why, you know, in our song we talked about Sujulam Sufalam, the good water and the good food. We've now made it Kuf Jalam and Kuf. Kufalam, you know. I mean, there's not a body of water that is not totally poisoned. Look at the Yamuna in Delhi, just carrying loads of toxics. And all the streams that join it. We've just done a study because two nieces of mine got cancer in the last few months. And I said, something very funny is going on. So I sent my team in one village, Gagnoli, in Bagpat. 100 people with cancer. From Punjab, which is called the land of the Green Revolution, a train leaves whose name has become the cancer train. Overall, nationally, we've had a 30% increase in cancer rates in the last five years. We're spending more than $300 billion, 18 lakh crores annually. Diabetes is in every household. We're spending, the, the, the rates of diabetes jumped uh, from, uh, in 2012, it was 180 lakhs, and of them, seven lakhs lost their lives because of the complications. In 2010, it had jumped to 32. Uh, the, the cost had jumped to $32 billion. We are talking about epidemics. We are talking about what we call the hockey, st you know, growth like that. And it's not just in India. Of course, in India, um, it's big because our numbers are big. Our vulnerabilities are huge. But I've just edited a book, and I think some copies will be available there. I got a friend of mine to analyze data in the United States because while traveling, I read a Center for Disease Control report which said that 10, 20 years ago, one in 100,000 children in the U.S. were autistic, which had jumped to one in 65 five years ago. And it had jumped further to one in 35 two years ago. So I said to her, I said, this graph, you know, is very scary. And this is government data, the center of disease control. Can you do an analysis? That's what the graph is looking like. And it's got total correspondence with the spread of glyphosate and GMOs. There were no GMOs in, in the US before that, and autis autism was hardly there. And because the GMOs in US are made for Roundup resistance, which is glyphosate, the combination is what's leading to this. Uh, Stephanie Seneff is a scientist at uh, MIT, and I've been at conferences with her, and I said, you know, there are elements of this, which little bits we know. Can you put it all together? What are the problems that start in the body when you get autism? What leads to autism in the body? What are the processes unleashed by glyphosate and Roundup Ready crops? that change the body systems to trigger the processes. And the simple fact is this. Our bodies are made of 600 trillion cells, of which 600 million are human cells. Now the companies say it doesn't harm humans, but it doesn't harm 600 million cells. The rest of the cells are bacteria, and it harms them. So the gut, you know, they're now talking about the gut being the richest ecosystem of biodiversity. And when beneficial bacteria are killed, the enzymes they produce are dying, the neurotransmitters, those enzymes produce are dying, and that entire system of what's happening is uh, it's mentioned here. These are the kinds of researches that need to be done. We synthesized all the data available in India. About three years ago, uh, for Dr. M. G. K. Menon, who used to be a, um, 
an eminent scientist as well as the Minister for Science and Technology. And he'd been uh, looking for the Supreme Court at the issue of toxic dumping. And then he asked me, he said, Vandana, can you put together the research on what's happening with pesticides? Because this is not dumping in one place, it's pervasive. So we wrote a book called Poisons in Our Food and synthesized studies done by doctors, people in IITs. I think we are one of the worst affected. And interestingly in Jaipur, the study showed that the vegetarians were worse affected because the non-veg people eat goats that grow graze in the wild. So they eat safe food. Whereas the vegetarians are eating vegetables sprayed with pesticides, so they have a higher dose of pesticide. The same damages that are happening to our body are happening to the environment. 75% of the bee population of the planet is gone in large areas, including with Harba where we work, where a person we work with for honey mentioned they're not getting honey, there's a girl doing a PhD with us on pollinators. I told her to go down. She didn't find a single pollinator on a BT cotton plant. And the difference between a normal cotton and a BT cotton, and it could be in a hybrid or it could be in the new discussion they've started on what they call straight varieties. BT is normally an organism in the soil and it releases this toxin only in the gut of particular insects. So in the environment, it's not a toxin. Enzymes in the gut of the caterpillars turns it into a toxin and kills that particular. But you take the gene that expresses the toxin, put it into the plant where it's being expressed in every cell in high dose all the time, in the roots, in the pollen, in the leaves. It's now targeting in a straight way, not just the caterpillar, but all species. So farmers end up using more pesticides, but the pollinators die. That same PhD student did a study on our farm in Dehradun, and I hope some of you will come even for a holiday. We run a lot of courses, but they're beautiful cottages. We grow more than 2,000 plant varieties because I really began this work to save seeds. And she found six times more pollinators on the farm than in the forest, compared to the chemical farms, about 20 times more. A soil ecologist just did a study after 20 years. He'd come 20 years ago to the, the Dune Valley and our farm. He has found 350% more nitrogen buildup through organic methods and 150% more carbon. The illusion of chemicals have made us believe that nature doesn't know how to function. And nature doesn't know how to create soil fertility. Nature doesn't know how to control pests. You've got to have the poisons. And one reason I do so much research on this is that I have a deep passion for science and knowledge. And this kind of abuse of science troubles me a lot. To be told that us, we don't have the shikimate pathway when the bacteria do. To be told that pesticides are safe and GMOs are safe and all the evidence is showing what they're doing. And the right to save food is a fundamental right. The right to food is a fundamental right. We have crossed the distinction of having more hungry people than Africa today. We are the capital of hunger. Africa has an average of 21%. We have 42% children who are either dwarfs because, you know, becoming shorter, or what they call wasted, their weight is going down. They're not getting either enough to eat or the right things to eat. So diseases related to food, related to food are affecting everyone. And the figures globally are a billion people are going hungry today, but two billion are sick because of bad food. I just gave you 
a few figures on cancer treatment, on diabetes treatment. But we've done an entire analysis of the social and ecological impact of what this means, these chemicals mean, in terms of bird deaths, pollination deaths, soil and water degradation, in getting farmers into And this is for 300,000 farmers? I have never, to date, had an official response to the crisis of debt farmers are facing because of the high costs of inputs. The same toxic chemicals that are giving people cancer are pushing farmers to suicide. It's the same poison. The root is the same. And that's why the solutions must be the same. Not only are we told that these chemicals are safe, we're repeatedly told they help us produce more food. And the story goes this way. Till we had the Green Revolution, we were starving. Not true. I've written a whole book on this because of Punjab. The 1965-66 drought basically meant that to regulate prices in the cities and those big townships like Bukharo and all which were being built, India needed to import a little more wheat. It was about importing wheat to regulate prices, not because anyone was dying. And the US government said, sorry, we won't send the wheat till you take the chemicals. And the Green Revolution, so-called, was introduced. If any of you are interested, the book on the violence of the Green Revolution is available from Natraj Publishers. And you can have access to it. So I did this study for the United... I did it for the United Nations. First, I found, no, food hadn't increased in Punjab. Rice and wheat production increased. And now 20 million to tons rot every year in the go-downs. Rice and wheat are not the only food. We need our dals, we need our oil seeds, we need our vegetables, we need our fruits. And when I did the calculations, we actually went down in overall food production. And there are three ways in which chemical farming, including GMOs, reduce the availability of food and nutrition to people. The first is they grow commodities which are for trade, not food which is for nourishment. That change itself means you no more care about what you're growing and where it's reaching. 90% of the GMO corn and soya in the United States is going for biofuel and animal feed. It's going to factory farms and to drive cars. And it's going there because the subsidies are huge. When something is a commodity, neither does its quality matter, nor does its reaching the people who need it matter. The second level at which this crisis of food has been created is by growing commodities in monocultures, we are actually growing less food. We need diversity. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ayurveda, but Ayurveda basically says, if your meal doesn't have five tastes, it's an incomplete meal. And having five tastes was a way for every ordinary person to know you were eating a diversified diet. UNESCO has given recognition to diets like the Mediterranean diet, because it's little more diverse, little more diverse than the diet of Northern Europe, for ex instance. But look where the vegetables top from zucchini, eggplant, tomato, bell peppers. That's it. You can't even end counting the kinds of vegetables we have. from our wonderful um, sahajan tree to in the desert of Rajasthan, that Kejri tree where 270 years ago or more, Amrita Devi and 200 other Bishnois gave their lives when the king was, uh, king's army was trying to cut the trees for whitewashing the palace. It was the first Chipko. And of course, the next Chipko was the one that inspired me. Not only are we, you know, and I'm, 
both in Wealth Per Acre as well as we have another report called Health Per Acre. Per acre nutrition output is much more on biodiverse ecological farms than on chemical monocultures. And the graphs of every nutrition, whether it's iron or energy or carotene, thiamine, everything that we need, we produce more by working with nature, not against nature. And we've always been told the reason you need to put those chemicals is humans have to be fed. We're going to be nine billion soon. Well, if humans have to be fed, you need to be even more careful about not damaging the soil, the biodiversity, the water, the climate that gives us food. My book, Soil Not Oil, that Radhika mentioned, was really taking stock of how much is chemical industrial farming contributing to climate change. It's 40%. And how much can organic solve it? 100%. We have the capacity to put enough organic matter in the soil, which increases our ability to produce more food without chemicals. But by putting carbon in the soil where it belongs and taking out excess carbon from the atmosphere where it doesn't belong, with two tons per hectare of carbon, and we have that much and more on our farm, and if all farms function that way, you could draw out all the excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and bring it to this magical figure of 350 parts per million, which is what scientists say is required if you have to stabilize temperature increase to 2 degrees. Organic farmer is a climate answer. Most people only look at fossil fuels, and because in the West uh, most people are estranged from agriculture, they only look at the energy transition. So they talk about solar systems and windmills. They don't talk about the food transition, which is the easier transition. Why is it easier? Because everyone can participate in it, including in cities. We have a colleague um, who uh, now is getting married, Aditi. She lives somewhere nearby. Well, Aditi, having spent two hours in Navdanya, has started a whole movement of rooftop gardens in Mumbai. With the crisis in Greece, as you know, Greece, Greece is going through a very difficult situation. Um, we work with movements in Greece. We work with seed savers in Greece. And uh, two years ago, there was this young man who started a balcony garden. And he said, I supply my entire street from a tiny little terrace. The abundance that can be produced is amazing. And the abundance is at every level. It's at the level of the biological processes, it's the level of energy processes, and it's in terms of the financial issues. Now, I'm sure you as auditors and chartered accountants would totally reject a firm where you were spending 10 times more than you were earning. It would be unviable. In chemical agriculture, 10 times more is spent financially than what is the value of the products. How does this work? Because of subsidies. In 2008, when the Wall Street collapse happened and the prices of all commodities shot up, food, fertilizer, the fertilizer prices went high and India was spending more than one trillion rupees as subsidies for just nitrogen fertilizer subsidy, not the import bill, the subsidy bill. If you take the energy, I know as a scientist, no system could work if the energy you put into it is 10 times more than the energy you get out of it. Hundreds of studies show that 10 kilocalories have to be put into a chemical industrial agriculture system to get one kilocalorie of food. Now if you take that further into factory farming, where grain is fed to animals, you're talking about 100 kilocalories producing one kilocalorie. In physics we call this the creation of entropy. 
Because living systems use energy to organize life. Entropy dissipates energy and turns it into waste that is not usable. Ecological agriculture doubles the energy available. So if I'm have, I put in one in unit, I get two to ten units of food out of it. Why is this not counted? It's not counted because all that's counted is how many people are working on the land for efficiency. So the more farmers you can get rid of, the more productive your agriculture is supposed to be. Now, productivity is output per unit input. So you should count it, calculate all the outputs. A farm with 200 outputs produces more. A farm with very little input has higher efficiency. But what's counted as an output is just the commodity that leaves the farm, the wheat or the rice or the soya or a hybrid corn that is spreading very fast in this country, or even the BT cotton, they're not food. 75% of the hybrid corn is going for animal feed in India, 75%. And cotton, of course, is not eaten. The oil is being used for blending, which is illegal because we're not supposed to have GMOs in our food. That's what the current laws say. Not only is there wastage in the system, there's wastage of food. The studies are now showing that globally 50% of the food is being thrown away. 50%. And the larger the distribution system, the more the wastage. There are entire movements in the West now where young people are rescuing this waste to feed the hungry. But there's also wastage of resources. Our studies have shown that 93% of the biodiversity in agriculture has been pushed out by the mono monocultures of about five commodities, with just one or two varieties cultivated worldwide. 75 to 90% of the water in the world is used today for irrigation. And why is there such a huge demand for irrigation? First, because when you use chemicals, the soils lose all their ability to retain water. The figures are showing that if you have 0.5% organic matter in your soil, you can increase the water retention capacity up to 80,000 liters per hectare. With 1%, more than 180,000 liters. So your soil itself, that's organic, is giving you more food, holding more water, getting rid of drought, as well as dealing with climate change, which creates more drought. It's breaking out of that vicious cycle. But the second reason why there's so much irrigation in chemical agriculture is because these varieties are hybrid varieties which need more water. So our old cottons and the scar that uh, Radhika showed you is made of traditional desi cotton, organic. Then it's grown organically and it's woven in the Gandhi ashrams in Vardha and printed there. Desi cotton can grow without irrigation. The hybrid BT cotton requires irrigation. One reason Vidharba has had such high levels of farmer suicides is because the failure rates have been high. And there's a very good uh, paper published by a Berkeley scientist called Andrew, which um, is cited in a, a long story I've done of what happened in the last 30 years to the cotton in India. Um, that has said, it's analyzed in detail, the varieties, the meteorological condition, and saying these were totally unreliable varieties for Vidharba and the Rainford area. Sadly, this overall, the system of agriculture that's destroying um, about 75% of the planet is only giving 30% of the food. Even today, 70% comes from small farms, which are outside the system. And 100% could come from small farms. And we could re reverse that 75% destruction. But if we go down this path 
of more chemical farming, more industrial agriculture, by the time we reach 45% supply, we'll have a dead planet. We won't be able to, there won't be soil that can grow anything. There will not be um, water. Large areas of India today are abandoned because they ran out of water. They ran out of groundwater, the rivers are dead. Now how do you connect these three tragedies? The tragedy of hunger, because I really believe no child should be hungry in this abundant land. We have the capacity to grow food, but we are not growing food anymore. No one should be falling ill because of the food they eat. And no farmer should be committing suicide for providing us with food. As I mentioned, behind all of these three is a system of agriculture that's capital intensive, chemical intensive, toxic, focusing not on nourishment, but focusing on trade. Interestingly, of the 250 million people in India who are hungry, half of them are farmers. And this, of course, sounds puzzling. Why would farmers go hungry? Because they are borrowing for chemicals and the seed. And when they grow the food, they can't eat it because they have to pay back whoever is the money lender. So in Urissa, which has so much rice, in Kalahandi people are hungry, the rice fields are full because of this debt trap, where they're constantly selling back. So what we've done <coughs> in Nabdani over the last 30 years is connect the, the solution of the ecological crisis to a solution to the farmer's crisis and agrarian crisis, and originally to the nutrition crisis. But in the last five to 10 years, with the explosion of not just malnutrition, but new diseases because of toxics, because this kind of chemical food gives us two harms to our health. The first is it's producing nutritionally empty food, which is not really meeting all the needs of our body. But secondly, it is bringing toxics in that food. So it's missing what should be there, which is nourishment, and loaded with what shouldn't be in food. One reason many people come to Navdanya is because we started with seeds, so we've saved the ancient seeds of moong and urad and tur. Because now you go to the market, you get that silly yellow pea dal, which is not a dal. I am on the advisory board of CAG, Control and Accountant General. I, um, sit there. So I see the reports. To import this yellow pea from the United States, 25,000 crores of kickbacks were involved. You know, the CAG, like you do, accounts for particular firms, etc. they do accounts for the nation. And uh, we could be growing the dal if we don't do a chemical farming, because chemical farming requires monocultures. With ecological farming, you grow your wheat and you can grow your chana. You can grow your juari and you can grow your tur. So on 2nd of August, I went to Meerut, which is where our first independence movement started. And started an Anna Swaraj movement as the third independence movement because our new problems are all related to food. How we grow it, what is in it, how it's distributed. And we focused particularly on a very concrete initiative which we call the Food Smart Citizen for Food Smart Cities. You might have seen in the paper, 58 cities have been identified for smartness. Now my colleague who does translations, he said, Didi, smart nahi kya sakte, kyoki smart in Hindi means chalu. <laughs> and then I, I looked at the etymological roots. The original is a German word, which was used for heavy pain. You know, you smarted. When there was big pain in your elbow, you, it was smarting. So it started from pain, became smart Alec, the Chalu, and now we want smart cities, which we feel should have people's health and well-being at the center of it. Now I notice how um, um, Mumbai is out of the smart city. Navi Mumbai is, Greater Mumbai is part of smartness. 
but you don't have to be left out of being food smart, which in Hindi we are calling Anna Sampan. Nagrik. And what are the keys of this? To first make sure your children you are eating healthy food. Because when cancer hits, it doesn't warn you. you know, maybe two decades after eating pesticide residues, you'll get cancer. Maybe you'll get it because your diet was not complete and the immunity and resilience wasn't built into it. So the idea of Food Smart Cities is to know what you're eating and to participate in shaping systems that allow good food to be grown. We've started this in Meerut because even there this year, because of the untimely rain and the hailstorms, farmers would go to the field, see their wheat crop died, and they either commit suicide or they just died on the spot in shock. So the data, the record says, died of shock. 200 are study show just now. So we said, no, they need to have resilience to deal with this climate change. And those who are using the resilient seeds and doing organic farming, they didn't have a crop collapse because the soil held the water. And the plants themselves are more resilient. So we took commitments from the citizens of Meerut. And my colleagues are now traveling through West UP, which is very difficult to ring, to put the cities and the farmers together in a direct relationship so that people get healthy food in cities and farmers get a full income. I know there's a city in Brazil called Belo Horizonte and the mayor was an enlightened mayor. He said, I'm going to open up every space that's public for farmers to come and just sell directly. You know how the economics changed? The farmers' income doubled what consumers paid went to half. Just through those direct sales. Now our cities are a little more difficult, partly because they're a little more corrupt. You know, we hear a lot about BMC and the potholes and all the money that gets eaten. Um, so citizen participation has become an absolute must. I really feel it's only when citizens get involved that even our leaders will realize that smart cities should have health and well-being and food and biodiversity and ecology. Because in the long run, when things collapse, it'll not be the cement that'll take care of us. It'll be the soil and the food. And that's why taking care of all of this becomes a major, major duty. These flyers are available. At the end of it, they have a form. If you fill it, I'm sure Rita and Lata can work out a way that delivery systems, they, do, they deliver actually, that you, that you can start getting organic food delivered. But what I'd like to do is take it one step further. Because of the suicides in Vidharba, where farmers have been trapped in this cotton cultivation, when I used to go, even in the 90s, you know, the cotton would be grown with the juari, would be grown with the pigeon pea, would be grown with chili. There was no monoculture. Now it's just cotton monoculture. And now they're growing a little bit of soya bean. It would be really good to encourage the Vidharpa farmers to grow food again by at least some families here saying, we are going to be a circle that eats organic and buys directly from the farmer. And I know the four crops that you can easily plan for if you plan for next year would be wheat, they have very good wheat, very good chana, very good tur, very good juar. So talk amongst yourselves, talk with your friends, create these circles in which we start to shape the future of our food, the future of our health, the future of our well-being. I want to conclude by another phrase that is from our ancient tradition, which very few people remember, but I have two physics friends who actually wrote a book on the food traditions of India, and they've quoted 40 pages from the Mahabharat, 80 pages from somewhere else, um, and Tetra Upanishad, 
And the phrase that really should be our motto as a civilization is Annam Bahu Kurvita, grow and give food in abundance. And this text actually says to grow food and share it is the highest dharma. And to grow bad food and give bad food is the highest sin. It has put dharma in the daily act of eating. And that's where we'll have to protect this. Because sadly, you know, in today's world, a few consultants uh, decide what will be smartness and what will be intelligent. Um, and each of you, for your own sake, for the sake of the farmer, for the sake of the planet. Because those three alignments are one alignment. They are alignments that are about respect for life and respect for the dignity of every life. Thank you.
take care of the welfare of the public. Mm -hmm.
with the cost of production and the price of the final product have no correlation. In everything else, the cost of production is reflected in the final price. In agriculture, what I've learned in my 30 years of research is the more costly the production, the cheaper the end result. How does that happen? Because of two factors. One is collect tax money and subsidies. I told you about a trillion just for chemical fertilizers. There's another trillion to buy costly food for which the government has given subsidies for chemical fertilizer. Then it has given an MSP to the farmer to make their earning a little more than the production. Then they have a huge subsidy to store this grain in the godown where it's rotting. And then they have a subsidy to bring it to you at two rupees. And the previous system. Add it all up, my guess is we are talking about a five trillion dollar subsidy to cheat on food prices. Exactly the amount of money they spend on getting bad toxic food to the ration shops could be spent on procuring organic food. And organic would be affordable and cheap. It's not, as I said, a direct reflection of the cost of production. But there is another reason, and that has to do with the fact that uh, you know, the people who are moving towards organic are paid more privileged. And therefore, I know shops in Oscars run that rent. Come on. If you don't have it all. In addition, no pesticide loaded food has to put a label before this pesticide and it can give you this cancer. And we give you this pesticide and it can cause this. There's no label. We have to certify. Certification not certification. I just had inspectors drop in at a warehouse here yesterday. My colleagues were coming. They come to our test curry. Art sample they got in, they did our it sample. So that cycle of punishing organic and rewarding toxic has been built into the very structure of national classical policy. And that's because grids can twist these things around. One reason we started with food quantity is people should decide what they want to eat. And once they decide that these circles grow bigger, and I really feel if you do it properly, we can reach 200 cities. I'm not saying all the population, because as far as the poor are concerned, the government will have to make food available to them. They have no purchasing power. They say, let them have healthy food. After all, you're spending our money to feed the poor, spend it for healthy food. But those who have the ability and flexibility to have a purchasing power can shift. In the US, the big way in which organic grew was through what we call the CSAs, Community Support and People in the city said, I'm going to buy directly from a farmer, and I support that farmer. Then they put the money down in the beginning of the season. And for the whole season, the farmer goes to it and distributes boxes on the doorstep. We just need much more of that. I have one question. Um, we have been using this chemical fertilizer and pesticide since the last 60, 70 years. So our soil is already spoiled, so um, how it can be corrected? Is it easy to reverse this process? Uh, first of all, it's only Punjab where it started in 66. Mm -hmm. Even in Punjab it grew so. The large parts of India, where all this is only spread now, there's still parts of India that are far away tribal, no organic by default. Uh, you call in, we all call it. The body recuperates. The healthier you eat, the faster it recuperates. You're not told when you're ill or you have typhoid how poor a problem I'm going to come. No, you're told to take how. The soil is a living system. The more you give it healthy nourishment, just like when we give our bodies healthy nourishment, and the healthy nourishment for soil is organic matter. The more quickly it gets out of the diseases that have been created. What's the diseases caused by chemical agriculture? Here's beneficial organisms and allows pathogens to grow. When we give good food to the soil, the beneficial organisms come back on their own. 
That's the magic of living systems. And they control the magic. Just as much as when friendly insects flourish, the pests they control. So, you know, recognition that nature knows what it's doing. And nature is the ultimate smart entity. Thank you, Vishen. However, this is what she told her. This organic food which are picking in wherever the shops are. How do we just find out whether it's genuinely organic one, one pick in that? Because they, they have just come up like mushrooms in mm -hmm. so many places. So you know, like it times in whether it is genuinely it is organic or not. And secondly, is there any system which you are facing to that Dance or what okay. But apart from that, the fruits and vegetables or all these things, if there is a group of people or anything, you know, like can be done like that. So more like there is some people who are interested in we trust the organization of yours or everything that we are getting the genuinely organic food. Sure. So as far as Adani is concerned, the reason we hung in there is to continue the authentic. There are lots of people who jumped into organic because you can't sell it at a high price. Um, if you want to make sure is it really organic, you'll have to get the test done and pay for it, which is very costly. As I told you, that's better skin, yes, it's a real you know, you test every pesticide. It's a very costly job. The other way you can ensure you're eating truly organic is know the farmer or know the group that works with the farmer. I mean, for uh, we have everything. If you notice, everything that's needed for the Indian kitchen. And I made this commitment in the beginning. You know, the government has put organic in the export division of Boss Ministry. I said, why do you assume? Because I'm on the national board. I said, why do you assume organic is good for Europeans and Indians can eat poison? Why are we ourselves doing a nutritional apartheid on ourselves? So I said, okay, we do the work to make sure everything in Indian kitchen needs is available. So we made sure, except that it comes from different parts of the country. What I'm proposing to you through this Food Smart Cities and Anna Sampan Nagri is let's begin with Vidhava, where the farmers crisis is together. And let's begin with the four brains and if you put together a collective. And then you say, you know, these ten families that I know would need this much meat in the season, would need this much chana in the season, and what our team will do is make sure that sacks of that chana and sacks of that tool and sacks of the jewelry reaches Bombay. And that will already cut, cut costs because as I said, the huge costs are packaging and labeling. And with us, you don't have to worry. It is not on every little package which they can part and part and part. Because we do this not for trade. We do it because it's our commitment to us never put them. It's our commitment to one is Brahma. For us, it's our highest duty. If you can organize around these four or five brains for these larger part, I know the momentum will be created that we will then be able to contact farmers who grow fruits, who grow vegetables, because the whole issue is to repair these broken systems. The relationship between the earth and the farmer has been broken. That has been repaired, that's organic farming. The relationship with the farmer and the consumer has been broken. That is repaired by this direct relationship. And as soon as there's momentum, I can tell you, it catches on. There's nothing like a good virus spreading. A virus of a good practice and a good idea. So I think what happens we to get out of is expect perfection and everything. Gandhi, whose picture is there, he was a member of this, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Gandhi had said, don't expect the system to change before you will act. Your actions are what will make the system change. And don't make it an excuse that others haven't changed. Because your duty is to make, be the change you want to see. That was his big teaching for the world. So be the change you want to see. And I know you all have strong influence, you have strong networks, 
if you become the hub for this to work with the Nabnania team, things like that. Thank you, everyone. On behalf of my mother, Yamini Dalal, and family, I thank BCA, Dr. Vandana Shiva, and all those who have come today to attend this lecture meeting in the memory of my late father, Dilip Dalal. All good things must come to an end, and so does this. Year after year, tirelessly and enthusiastically, BCA and its team have arranged lecture meetings in the memory of my late father, inviting eminent dignitaries 
to speak on various interesting topics. I and my family generously thank BCA for taking so much pain and their support and efforts all along. I now call upon my mother, Yamini Dalal, to present a token of gratitude to Dr. Vandana Shiva. Thank you, everyone.